Local Mishmash, this one being broadcast live September 25th, 2019. I've got the mystery box on the table. I've got issues with this Tamron 17 to 28 lens that I said I loved and I still do, but I want to caution you about it. I also want to talk about this laptop. I have, maybe we should just call today's show the issues show because I've got issues with some of the stuff on the desk. But before we get to all of that, I want to bring in my good friend and co-host for this show, David Carr. David, how are you doing today? I'm great, man. Good to see you again, Toby. Welcome good. back from Zion. It's good. And uh, thank you so much. You know, for yeah. those of you who might be a little confused because David is not Steve. Uh, Steve was scheduled to be here, but you know, the truth is he just doesn't care about us anymore. <laughs> he moved from small town Knoxville to up to the big city of Cincinnati and he's just like all high and mighty now. And he's like, I just don't have time for that. <laughs> Actually, so. I am Steve. This is one of those <laughs> deep fake kind of things. Oh, like, yeah. Like my face. You're just going to you're gonna peel it off or yeah. just di digitally you're going to melt into like little zeros and ones. Yeah, exactly. Cool. I feel like that's happening anyway cool. in my brain. So, Well, the, the you deep fake Steve, you sound much, much better. <laughs> It's, so, a, it's this. It's all this, man. It's, it's the process. Right. All right. So uh, welcome. Uh, Steve could not be here today. He really did want to be, but he had something come up. So uh, at some point, he'll be back eventually. So he says. But I really think all of you should go message him and be like, Steve, what about those little people? Don't you still love us? I'm including myself in that, by the way. <laughs> so, so. Uh, Good old Steve. Yeah. So uh, this show, as I said, I've got some issues. I also have the box that I'm going to unpack. Chat room, I'd love for you to guess what it is. Uh, I, I don't think it'll be too hard to guess. Uh, a little context, I'm going on a what should be a fairly epic McKay workshop that starts tomorrow. I'll be leaving the house around 9 a.m. I was telling David right before the show starts. I must know in the back of my head it's going to be an epic trip because I'm pretty much packed for it. And the fact that I don't leave until 9 a.m. tomorrow and I am packed now today at 2 p.m. Pacific time. Well, that's uh, pretty amazing. That's so, pretty impressive, man. I mean, I, 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 that's, that's going to be my challenge to myself before my next big trip is to yeah. be packed the day before, not it, scrambling around the house an hour before trying to find some stupid toiletry item that I can't find. Yeah, yeah. It just, it's just a nicer peace of mind. Now, I will say that, you know, the flip side of that is... I kind of wanted to get out a new video before I left, but no, that's not going to happen. Yeah. But I am, but I am packed. You know, it's good, man. Take so battles. So. Yeah. So, and I want to say hi to um, chat room. Uh, you guys, thank you so much for hanging out with us on your Wednesday afternoon, or if you're not watching this live from whenever you are. Many of you are Photo Enthusiast Network members. That is a community that I started along with uh, David McKay, Ali McKay, and Steve, even though he's too big for his britches now. <laughs> um, and it is a fantastic community where uh, you get access to hundreds of hours of educational videos. And most importantly, the thing, the part of it that I'm most proud of is the community that we're running and how well that works. And we lost David Carr there, but I'm sure he'll come back in a minute. Uh, it is just a really good group of people there to help you and answer your questions. And the most important thing, and David put out a Tuesday tip, each Tuesday you get a new article in your inbox. Sometimes it's about what should your slowest shutter speed be that you can handhold based on a bunch of different factors, some you may have never thought of before, um, along with a whole host of other articles like joining a community. And the reason why you want to join a community is you create these images. You, you're out there in the field, you're snapping these pictures, you think they look pretty good, you get them on your computer, you start to edit them, and you start to reach a point where you're like, well, did I push this too far? Does it look a little bit better? A and B version? You're just not sure. Wouldn't it be nice to put that image in front of a helpful, wonderful group of people that's going to say, hey, I love this aspect of A, but I love what you've done in B. Maybe think about this little bit of a different crop. Or have you thought about a black and white with a little bit more contrast? And again and again, I see people posting wonderful images and getting fantastic feedback on them. So all of that can be found at the Photo Enthusiast Network. You can go to photorec TV slash pen or slash join to find out more information. It's a great, great resource. Um, and uh, it's just a fantastic thing for you all to join in. So check that out if you're not already a member. Those of you who are watching who are members, thank you so much. Uh, we really appreciate it. And 
speaking of appreciation, uh, I really appreciate Squarespace. They sponsor many of my videos. They make this show partially responsible and much of what I do. If you're looking for a new website, Squarespace is a fantastic place to build it. It's gorgeous, beautiful, easy, drag and drop, 24 seven tech support. And you can build a storefront, you can build a gallery, you can build a membership site. It has everything you want to do and it does it so well and so smoothly. So check them out. Squarespace.com slash TV will save you 10% off your first purchase. So it's good. It is good. I, you know, I, I feel a little threatening with this knife right up in my face. So I'm just going to put the box down. We'll get to it very soon. I know some of you, you don't care about this show. You just want to know what's in the box. Yeah, it's like Christmas. So um, we'll, we will. We'll get to that in just a minute. But a couple other like a little bit of housekeeping tips uh, as soon as I find my show notes, which thank you to Roy McKee for putting these show notes together. You can find all of the links to the articles we're discussing, all of the little notes I've made for myself. They're right down below this video after a text description that says show notes. It's funny how that works. Hmm. Um, I put out a Tuesday tip, jumpstart your editing. So I just mentioned uh, David uh, McKay's Tuesday tip of uh, joining a community and how beneficial that is. Last week, though, the week prior, I put out one about jumpstarting your editing, and it's about using the auto button in Lightroom. I've been finding it to be excellent almost all of the time for my pictures. Again, David Carr and I were talking a little bit before the show, though, and um, David, you haven't had as much luck with it. You want to talk a little bit about that? Well, I'll be quite honest with you. Sometimes I just forget that it's there. I'm still kind of stuck in like uh, Lightroom from maybe two years ago. Or I, There's certain things that I just don't think about that are there. And the auto button is one that I kind of forget about sometimes. But I saw you post about it recently, and I was like, I'm going to start messing around with that. And I had some trouble because I was uh, trying to apply it to some portraits that I'd done. You know, portraits that I was using lighting and kind of more studio environment. And I didn't find that it was helping me as much there, but that's not to say that it won't help, uh, you know, with landscapes and many other types of shots. I just felt I just felt like it was making things too bright and just kind of taking some of the moodiness away. Um, but I mean, be that as it may, I mean, like the fact that we have this technology now that can that can go in and automatically kind of get us to a pretty good ballpark of where, where we want to be is, is incredible. I mean, I've got portraiture software that does this where I can literally put the portrait in there and it will like retouch the face, um, whiten the, 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 the white parts of the eyes, brighten the eyes. I mean, it does it all. And sometimes it's a little off, but it's pretty close. So, I mean, we're getting to a scary level of uh, automation. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty impressive. And so, yes. So that's a great example of when I think it still doesn't work great. Uh, it really seems to want to create an exposure settings for your image that is very similar to what the camera would want to that kind of middle level exposure. And yeah. it doesn't take into account some of the more nuances of a, a moodier portrait uh, or a certain style. Yeah, I think you're right. And that, Cause I, a lot of the portraits I'm doing are, I do like, a, a darker portrait. I mean, the, my histogram is like, you know, all the, the, the shadows are real high and then they just, it just like flattens out. It almost looks like there's no information in the, in the, you know, in the highlights, which there mm -hmm. is. I do find myself having to crank the brightness up a little bit before I export. Cause on my screen they look great and then they end up looking dark on Instagram or something. But, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but all that to say, I think you're right. I think the auto function sometimes just wants to get that even exposure but, you know, a lot of times for landscape kind of stuff, that's what we want. I mean, we don't really want this d dark, moody thing unless you're just going for some kind of effect, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that's great. And, you know, in my example that I wrote, it really was all about landscape. And we should follow up with a little bit more about that, um, that, you know, it might not work for all genres of photography as as well as, as, as I um as I kind of proposed in the well, landscape one. Yeah, and maybe what I can do, I could actually take a couple of the portraits that I've been working on lately and apply an auto you know button to them and, and then show you kind of that compared to like what i've done just to see what the how they compare um that'd be awesome yeah i think that'd be kind of cool to see I, I need to do that for my own experimentation yeah yeah the other reason i said you know i'm, I'm kind of spoiling this article if you're not a pen member you don't have access to it but you know i want you to learn um i I hesitate to fully recommend it for those of you who are still really learning because in in the use of 
uh, automatic, automatically on import having the auto button applied, which is what I'm doing these days. Because what I like about that is when the pictures come in, when I look at them for the first time, they've been made to look nice and bright, which is how I typically edit my pictures. And what's really nice is it helps me speed through the process of deciding which composition is better. I typically, ah. I typically underexpose a lot of my images, landscape images, protect the highlights, right? So when you see them without any editing, sometimes the landscape part, the, the land part is pretty dark and dingy and you can't really get a feel for whether or not there's a distracting stick sticking up or things like that. And then you have to start to move the sliders a little bit. But if it's automatically happens on import, then boom, there it is. You got a good sense of what it can look like after some editing and you can make some quick judgments between, all right, these two images look very similar. Oh, I see I adjusted this exposure a little bit. Uh, that one's not the good one. This is, or sorry, adjusted the composition a little bit and, and throw it out. So yeah. I, I like that. It feels like it really speeds that process up. But if you are very new to the editing process or very new to the photography process, uh, it can bite you a little bit because you might look at an image and go, wow, I, I don't like how this looks. Maybe it's really noisy in a certain area or mm -hmm. um, just, you know, the colors are off from what you remembered. And it might not be from what you captured, but the editing Lightroom tried to do to it. And so then you're not, you don't know where the issue yeah, came from. Good. It's a, it's like shooting an automatic on your camera. I mean, when you're trying to go from being a novice, just enthusiast to a little bit more professional, um, you, you take it out of auto mode usually. Um, yeah. yeah, the auto mode will bring you this, like, it'll give you the overall quote, best exposure <laughs> usually. Bless you. Thank you. From across the country. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but um you know but but what we teach you to to shoot in manual or shutter priority aperture priority something like that because then you're getting creative control and you're and you know it's it's important to have that but what you said about speed is huge because i find myself lately taking way too much time sometimes editing a certain batch of photos and time is money if you're doing this professionally and also time is sanity i mean you can just start yeah. to lose your mind if you're standing at the, staring at the screen for too long so yeah speed up the workflow yeah. that's I, I like that i'm gonna try yeah. it yeah uh i i did think of a landscape I, you know i know this doesn't a star shots uh it, it auto again tries to expose the landscape as bright as daytime not quite it can't quite get there but those don't work either i have some star shots from zion so um watch out for that. But in general, I do like how it can speed up the process. Sure. Yeah. And Brian says he found that he got presets. Uh, he got a lot of them at the start. I think that's, you know, something people get Lightroom and they're like, oh, they, all these guys are offering these presets. Yeah. This There's a pack of a hundred that are free or here's some decent ones for 10 bucks. Um, and it delayed his learning of Lightroom because I think you're saying it was kind of a crutch. Uh, that said, you have now like 20 go-to presets, some you've built, some from others. And I think that's a great point. So, yeah. So many people I know uh, swear by presets, and I, I've really tried to get into them. Um, I've I've downloaded, I've spent good money on preset packages, and I find myself hardly ever using them because I just want to do the thing I want to do. And yeah. I don't know, that might be stuck off of me, but I just no. haven't found anything yet that I'm like loving, unless it's just like some subtle like sharpening little vignette kind of something that just sort of things that I would probably do anyway. Yeah. But yeah. 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 And then it's kind of, yeah. And then, then I feel like, is it really saving time or effort? Uh, but, but I think presets can in some cases. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, real quick, another reminder for pen members. It is September. Actually, I think your, your images were due for the image review, the monthly image review. This is where you get to submit images and potentially win fantastic prizes from Bay Photo or A Prize each month to the winning image. Um, I think that due date just passed us, but keep it in mind for the end of October, submit an image so that it can be reviewed by professional photographers giving you critical and helpful feedback. So keep an eye out for those posts, but there's a link in the pen post on Facebook and also on our community forum that tells you more about that. Also in the show notes on sale, SanDisk external SSD drives, one and two terabytes. They're back down to the price I paid. This is a little two terabyte SSD. I love it because it is small. It is robust. I don't have to worry about anything bad happening to it. It's great to travel with. And what I do now is keep my entire yearly catalog on one of these and uh, just plug it into whatever machine. And I love, you know, I'm testing this Asus. 
plugged in this drive that has my catalog and all 2019 pictures. There they are working on them, editing, come home from a trip, plug it into my uh, laptop or sorry, my desktop. Boom. They're all there. And uh, I really, I'm, I'm pretty happy with the system as, it, as it's working currently. That's what I do. And I've got the same drive. I brought it to uh, Tanzania and gosh, I love that thing. I mean, I was carrying around this big, heavy, rugged drive uh, before that was an actual, you know, hard drive with a disc in it and everything. And I love the versatility of this uh, of this little sand disc. They're great. Yeah, they really are quite nice. I just want to say real quick, Crystal says, a longtime follower, but just joined Penn. Crystal, thank you so much. I think from your profile picture, you are the one that takes beautiful pictures of your children. And your children are beautiful as well. And I like that. Thanks so much for joining. Awesome. Okay. Uh, we're going to dive into uh, the Lightroom section of this show. But, well, let me, should I open the box? Let's, let's split it up. Some people are here from the box. Some people are here to hear a little bit about the Tamron issues. Um, I'll open the box. Then we'll get to Lightroom. So I don't, I don't want to force people to stay around if they don't really want to. Yeah, just open it and people but, can move on. But <laughs> no, no. Um, the Lightroom session is fantastic. We've got some great pictures to look at. David and I are going to shock talk about. We're going to shock about um, what we would do to those pictures in Lightroom. I just fake opened the top because I just missed it. We might shock talk about it. It, it just it might have to hit get the, the beep button going. The uh, oh, yeah, the sensor button. Oh, I, I actually don't know how to do that. Um, so you know, <laughs> we have to censor ourselves. Uh, I, I saw no guesses from the box. Um, yeah, come on, guys. Take but a guess. I, it's okay. I, I just this is this is why. Well, I mean, there's many reasons why I don't have a million followers, but one of them is I'm just not a very dramatic, like, oh, here we go, guys. I just, I just don't do that too much. <laughs> um, here it is. I can't see if you can see what I'm seeing well enough. Oh, yeah. A little out of focus up front there. It is uh, the A7R4. Uh, wow. This... I did not buy this. Now, some of you say, wait, Toby, you said you weren't going to upgrade from your trusty A7R3. This is on loan to me from B and H wow. uh, for me to take to Mongolia and test. I haven't had my hand. That's not true. This weekend, one of our participants on the Zion workshop uh, on my Zion workshop had the A7R4 rented from Lens Rentals, uh, and I did put my hands on it. That was actually the first time I put my hands on it. So this one I get to try out. I'm gonna take to Mongolia. I am looking forward to trying this out. I think. They've done a really nice job and made improvements over the A7R3. I mean, isn't that what you want to hear with the latest body? Yeah. Uh, and maybe. <laughs> and um, there are no real drawbacks. You know, there's no like, oh, it's got this or that, but it's got this negative or that negative. However, based on talking with my reviewer friends and YouTubers and just watching other reviewers and listening, uh, I still feel pretty confident that I'm not going to upgrade. Uh, it is a better camera uh, in many ways, but that cost difference for the difference in performance it provides, I don't just I just don't think it's there for me. It might be there for you, and I hope I'll be able to answer that uh, when I'm finished in in the review. But uh, I am excited to take this because, well, I mean, 61 gorgeous megapixels of a golden eagle sitting on. Um, a Mongolian eagle hunter. Well, yeah, I'm a little excited about that. That's and great. Faster SD card slots in both of them. So let's just get it out a little bit. I will say that it does feel nicer in the hand um, based on my uh, holding it for a little bit at the workshop this weekend. They have nicely improved this grip here, much more comfortable. I've never really been bothered by the smaller grip, but uh, this is more comfortable. Buttons nice. are a little bit nicer. Viewfinder is a little bit nicer. And then of course, 61 megapixels with a slightly upgraded autofocusing system. Uh, it makes me pretty happy. So. Very nice. I'm excited to hear what you think of it. Yeah, yeah. It definitely just, they just put on a little bit more fit and finish there that uh, I think is, uh, is, is smart of them. Be really interested. You know, we all are still very much waiting for that A7S III. Latest mm. rumor, 120 frames per second, that it might have a fan built into it, which is what the uh, latest Panasonic full-frame video-centric camera has. It has a, uh, a fan like you get in a computer to keep that uh, sensor cool while it's working. Wow. Yeah. 
buy some extra so, batteries. Yeah, yeah. And Kevin says he hopes Canon sends me the 80 or 100 megapixel R Pro mirrorless. Yeah, I hope they do too. After inviting me to their Hawaii launch event, I haven't heard anything more from them. Hmm. I, there have been a couple events. Did you lose my email address, Canon? No. <laughs> I, so um, I'll, I'll stay tuned for more. If you're watching the show and you don't follow me on Instagram, you should follow me on Instagram. There'll be lots of stories anytime we have service in Mongolia that I'll be sharing with you. And I'll be sharing thoughts about this camera as I go along. But then, of course, sharing a complete uh, review video by the, when I get back. Um, and speaking of Instagram, you should follow David Carr too. His is linked right down below this video, shooting fantastic portraits, headshots, and when you're traveling, beautiful wildlife pictures as Thank you. well. Thank you. So that's all there. I'm okay. A, I'm a Swiss army knife of photographers. So um, let's get into a uh, Lightroom and let me see if I remember what I need to do. I need to share screen and um, I need to share entire screen allow and there it all is and we're over off on the side you know what i think i want to fill it up and i know that's a little Good. there we go all right here we go okay uh first up so this is the lightroom section if you're a photo enthusiast network member you were allowed to send in one to two images per show and we spend a few moments giving you some feedback on the image really this is designed to teach you some tips and techniques in lightroom more than anything else um, because you have as photo enthusiast network members a ton of other ways to get feedback on your images one is that monthly image critique but you can also post them i talked about it already you know everybody knows okay and uh, David Carr, you can see what I can see right now? Yes, I can see it awesome. in all of its glory. So uh, here we got a, uh, a gaggle of geese. Uh, like when it's this many, I feel like it should be a better thing than just gaggle. It should be like a, a Google gaggle of geese. Yeah, that's that's quite a few geese. I mean. It is quite a few geese. It's a house party. Um, you have any thoughts, David, or you want me to go? Okay, so um, I haven't read who's shot this is. Oh, this is Sue Stevens. Sorry. Okay, cool. Yeah, Sue Stevens. Okay. And she didn't send any specific, you know, like she wants this or that. So we're just going to give some general feedback. And yeah, I mean, so I think this is a really beautiful scene. I mean, it's it's kind of overwhelming how many geese there are, but in a, in a in a good way. I think it's very. Uh, I don't know how to put it. Like it's just, I'm not used to seeing that many birds all in one. Uh, shot so mm -hmm. that that right there is 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 very cool there are a couple things that that stand out to me initially i mean uh, i'm sure you'll say similar things toby but i feel like the uh the branches on the in, in the foreground are just that are you know they're out of focus and they're they're maybe a little just um just distracting but not as distracting as they could be because they are so out of focus mm -hmm. uh you really your eyes do tend to go more towards the birds than they do anything else well, but this would have been a situation where maybe shooting just from a slightly different angle and getting those limbs out might have helped the shot. Yeah, I agree too. I think out of focus stuff can be used for a framing device if mm -hmm. there's enough of it to really feel like a framing device. What about something pretty drastic like, yeah. like that? Yeah, I like where you're going with that. Um, I know that that cuts down a lot of what you shot there, Sue, um, but this is th something to think about in, in the future. Uh, I agree very much, David, that, uh, that that branch is just a little bit distracting. Yeah, you just want to make sure that the I always talk about the edges, like if it, just make sure those edges are kind of clean or they're really serving the purpose that you want them to serve. If there is going to be something in the edge, in the corner, whatever, just it needs to serve the whole photo in a way that. And th this is all, it's always opinion, but I just, it can be distracting. I think if something's out of focus in the foreground that doesn't really belong in the photo. Yeah. I hope that's yeah. not too harsh sounding. I just, that's, that's nope. my first take on it. Yep. I think that's great. Um, I definitely, well, you know, we are talking about auto. Let's see what happens if we hit auto here. Ah, yes. Yeah. Interesting. Um, it brightened it a tiny bit, which is what Kate suggested in the uh, chat, mm -hmm. uh, brought the highlights down shadows, it, it kind of some basic stuff. I tell you, I would like to brighten it a bit more because these geese are white, most mm -hmm. of them. And I, I kind of want that white to pop a bit without taking away a bit of the, uh, kind of sunset feel, or maybe it's dawn. I'm not sure, but the, the, the golden light feel. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, and the way I'm seeing it, I don't know if this is as accurate as what you're seeing, but like the the middle section there is is very dark. Um, I don't see much detail, but maybe you're seeing seeing more of it. Uh, this is kind of where it's like kind of black and brown. Um, so yeah, maybe brightening it will bring some of that out a little. Um, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But That's- here's a here's a good example. I want to say this. This is a good example of something really really interesting happening, and that alone makes this photo uh shareable and and it just interesting i mean sometimes when we're shooting we're shooting because there's beautiful color sometimes it's because there's a um a, a beautiful person or a mountain or something that's but this is one of those rare situations where this is not always happening right here you know so you captured a moment that's happening and to me that covers some of the I don't want to say imperfections, but some of the other things that may not have been quite as photographically, aesthetically on point, the, the fact that this is such a cool scene really, I don't know if that makes sense what I'm saying, but I, I yeah. feel like it really serves that, that the, the photo well. Yeah, I'm hearing you. I like that. Yep. Uh, I Brian in the uh, chat suggested the one-to-one crop. I I like that better, I think. I like that a lot. A yeah. little bit more of the birds. Uh, you know, the, the vertical crop was just a little yeah, too that's much. Good. And it just feels like this is a great thing to do when you have a lot of repetition is to really make sure that left and right just full of whatever object it is. Because then you can kind of imagine that the scene just goes on forever to the left or right. And I don't know, I can kind of imagine in my head the, the cacophony that these birds are making. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. And yeah. good suggestion, cool. Brian. And I wanted to say hello to Kate. Good to see you on here, Kate. Nice. Yeah. So I just made a couple of uh, additional edits here. Um, I think you could make some local too, maybe to try to bump it up a little bit, but I think that's generally pretty good. And we're going to move on. We've got a shot from Romaine who was on our Iceland, or sorry, Iceland, New Zealand trip earlier this year. This is of course the famed Wanaka tree in uh, Lake Wanaka. And it is a beautiful spot, a fun tree that just happened to grow out in the water. And uh, a lovely fall day in New Zealand. Gorgeous. So uh, first thing I notice is it might be a tiny bit crooked. So I hit my crop tool or the letter R. I I just remember that shortcut uh, pretty easily and it jumps me to this. What I like about that shortcut is even if you're in the library panel and you're like, oh, the first thing I need to do is crop. You hit R, you're moved to the develop panel and automatically into the crop tool. And now if I start to drag, I get the smaller grid lines and I can kind of judge. I could also grab this little ruler guy, find that water horizon line and draw right along it. And it should adjust uh, for what you think is level. Nice. Like that. Now, um, I think this is very nice. I wouldn't do a ton more to it. Maybe a local area adjustment that uh, does a little bit dehazing on the mountains in the distance, just a little bit, sure. maybe a little more blue sky up there if you wanted to, or you could go a little bit more golden to kind of have an even more even tone over the whole thing. Uh, you know, be careful with the dehaze tool because it does give you a sense of distance. Here are these massive mountains and we know they're off in the distance because they're a little hazy. Don't, you know, just crank stuff up so that the haze goes all the, all, all right, gone. Right, right. Um, but I'm curious, what do people think about uh, black and white? Hmm. Let me see. Let's see Let me see. It does. nice yeah i mean i think you could go either way i think there's some nice um golden colors that are part of the leaves here some of them are picking up a little bit more high like highlights than i like here you can see that some of them are just really fully catching the sun Mm -hmm. um and are a little bright spots so i might work on that but oh i like it when we zoom in and they're just it's just so sharp that's so yeah that's gorgeous yeah yeah, so, I think the colors work really well. The the the, the color of the water and the, and the trees. I mean, they kind of it's they they complement each other really well. So it, it works well in color. It works well in black and white, which doesn't is not always the case with uh, with these types of photos. Yeah, yeah. All right, so let's leave it color for a second. I'm going to bump texture up a little bit because I I always like to do that, and I'm going to bring blacks back up. I kind of do want uh, starting to 
do more than I want. I do want a little bit of uh, detail in the trunk, mm. just a tiny bit. Just, maybe not even detail, just not feeling so dark and heavy. Uh, but let's see. We could also just brush that on with the brush tool. And this is where my Lightroom starts to slow down because of running the screen sharing at the same time. So let's just a little bit of exposure, a little bit of shadows, and then I'm going to brush it on there and see if we can get any more detail out of that. I don't know if it's that important, but let's see. I'm seeing... Oh, my flow is turned way down. That's always a good thing to watch for. Definitely. So it's doing a little bit more, more than I want. I should auto mask should be turned on too now. And then a tip about the auto mask is once it's on, you can just click wherever your center is and it should do the same. So we should, hmm. we're going to move on in a second, but that should be adding a little bit. I don't know if you guys can see that the details come through a little bit more, but other than that, I think that this image is pretty good. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, one more, let's see. The first break in the tree is on the left, left side of the tree gap. Oh, I see people's suggestion. So let's see, what if we do that real quick? Um, I'm gonna hit the A key to take the aspect ratio off, crop for whatever story you tell. And folks are looking at coming in here to this area. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I was feeling like the, the tree on the far left was maybe the only real distraction to me, so. Come in just a little bit closer. Just kind of be really thoughtful about that. I think that's nice as well. Mm -hmm. And then and then I feel like this is, you know, now that we started cropping, it's funny on some images right away, I think about cropping and on others, you know, this one other than really straightening, for some reason, it didn't really strike me much, um, is I don't feel like we need as much headroom up there. Mm -hmm. uh, it just felt a little tall. There wasn't much, if there were epic clouds all the way up through the sky, then I'd want to show them. But, mm -hmm. you know, the sky was a little a little washed out here. And so we get in a little bit tighter on this tree now. Okay. People say not too far. Yeah, I think if you go back to about right there. Yeah. It feels, it just starts to feel correct to me. The trees yeah. in the, the trees in the right third and, or you approaching the right third. It just feels, yeah, somewhere in there is. Yeah. I mean, it's these things are so again subjective, but sometimes I just stand way back and look like, where is everything placed? Is this where I would want it? Yeah. Um, so yeah, just have I, to experiment with that. Yeah, I do. I like coming back to here because it, this is feels rule of thirdsy, pretty nice with our tree over here on the right third, and then balanced by these kind of heavier trees all together over there. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Thanks, it's thanks, Romain. Gorgeous shot. Sorry. Another. Uh, New Zealand shot. This one from a little bit further around the corner from the Wanaka tree. Uh, this is, I can't remember, but this is on the drive to Milford Sound. And I think this this little bit of dip here in the foreground, I really like this kind mm -hmm. of curve here that uses a framing device. What happens if we just kind of bring it in over here a little bit? Mm. Does it feel okay? Yeah, I mean, I think that, in my opinion, that feels good. Um, I'm wondering, I'm wondering what this would look like in black and white. But maybe, like, I mean, you could do sort of a test. But then this might be when you could really play with some black and white texture. I don't know because it feels like it's just being that it's midday. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes you can't get the drama you want in the colors because they're all lit so evenly and vividly. So. I think you can add this drama with black and white. Mm -hmm. So uh, following that, I just threw on this graduated filter up top and I'm bringing it down. So, and then bumped up the dehaze to really make the clouds stand out. Mm. Uh, it's, it's one of those things where I think personal preference, you could go the other way and make that sky feel much more cloudy, mm -hmm. or you can go this way and make just the individual lines and shapes and textures up there stand out. It also bring texture up in the sky a little bit as well or again, go in the other direction. That's kind of a personal preference up there. I, I think the black and white is quite nice because there isn't really any 
I bet it's going to be interesting now in color. I think the sky is a little bit too blue, but um, there isn't any like fantastic colors in this. We have a little hint of that in the lake, but overall, I think black and white is pretty smart. Yeah, I mean, that's that's always the the tough thing with a midday uh, landscape shot is um, unless the clouds, I mean, unless it's cloudy and there's something really interesting going on with that, that's diffusing the light. Um, it's, it's funny how we can be at a scene like this in person and be like, it's so beautiful. It's so amazing. And then, and then you take a photo and it's in pure color and it, it looks exactly like what you saw, but some, somehow to me, it can lose some of the spectacularness of it. I don't know if that's a word, spectacular -ness, but it can lose some of that. Um, and it's a great shot. It's framed well. It's a gorgeous scene. But this, I, I feel like the black and white serves it pretty well. I could see this hanging in a gallery, you know, pr framed beautifully more than I could see the color version. Mm -hmm. and that's And that's a lot of times how I'll judge wh what I want to do with a photo. Would, would I really, would I frame this and hang it on the wall as an art piece? Yeah, that's great. And, you know, this also, this is an interesting uh, uh, image to kind of share. This is shot at 15 millimeters, pretty darn wide. And I'm, I, if I remember correctly, Romaine has a Sony full frame body. So this is full, 15 millimeters on full frame. These mountains off in the distance are, are epic. They are big. They kind of loom over this lake, which thank you, uh, Buffalo Doc says, this is Lake Wakatipu on the way back to Queenstown. Yes, that's correct. I, thank you. Um, and so it, it, it does in some ways diminish the scene. And mm. uh, there are some really fantastic compositions here with a longer uh, telephoto lens that just gets maybe a mountain with the clouds, uh, you know, running across its face and a little bit of that water down below as well. But I think black and white was the way to go there. Nice suggestion. All right. Oh, thank you. Yeah. I can't, did we do this image already, Heather? Yeah, we, we did. I've oh, seen good. this one. Good. It, it was pretty, but I couldn't remember if we'd done it before. Oh. All right. We've got something quite different from Vince. Vince sends these in from time to time where he's done wow. a bit of editing. And uh, we have this, the raw, I think this is straight out of camera. And then his edited version right here. Um, and I actually, did I, maybe I might've tweaked this some already. Um, let me, if I go undo. Oh, it's just going to go back to images. So it's not going to undo anything I did to it. Uh, oh, I could do that. Import. And here's how it came in from Vince. And so earlier I was just looking at this, thinking about what I wanted to say and what I wanted to talk about. I don't know about you, David Carr. You were just talking about doing moodier portraits. This is certainly kind of in that genre of a very certain style. It's very moody. Yeah. Very um, but I'm still inclined to brighten it a little bit because I'm distracted a bit by the large shadowy areas that just have a loss of detail. Definitely. I feel okay. like when you have really dark shadows and you, you don't know what's happening there, it, 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 it can be distracting. As cool as the rest of the image is, it just it might help to have a little detail there. Yeah. So I um, bumped up exposure a bit and then bumped up the shadows a bit more and tweak the blacks just a bit, basically raising those a little. And I just felt like his color was off. He's mm. got red hair, but I, I'm not sure that this really should be as warm as it is. Mm. I, I could be wrong. So I dropped the saturation just a bit. Mm -hmm. And then what did I do? Did I, I tweak the exposure one more time and brought it back down a little bit to kind of compromise. So now we have a hints of the full arm in here uh, but it just doesn't disappear totally into darkness. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And sometimes in, in a shot like this, you will have to start doing some local area adjustments. I mean, you might have to brush in some highlight yeah. or some uh, some shadow, pull the shadows up. I mean, I'm I'm finding out more, finding more and more that I, I need to do the local adjustments. And that's one of the things that, um, that, that David McKay is big on is not just always re relying on your sliders. Um, get a good uh, feel for for everything with the sliders, but then don't be afraid to like find those little spots that need a little little bump here and there and, and, and work them. It really can take it to the next level. You just have to be careful how much you do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree completely. And that's another uh, uh, an important point about those uh, pushing the auto button. It only moves these sliders right here. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, for my family pictures and quick snapshots, that's oftentimes as far as I want to go, but it is incredibly rare, or let's say it this way, 
I almost always do local adjustments to every image I put on Instagram or sure. if it's going to be a print. Yes, absolutely. Take the time because that is such a powerful feature of any editing program, but I, I really like it in Lightroom. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Yeah. It's a very cool shot. This is so unique. You know, it's, it's very, you don't see stuff like this all the time. It is. It is. And I, I wonder if cooling it a bit more, does that help kind of connect to the light of uh, the lighting? I saw that just Kyle thinks that, you know, he wants a little bit more kind of tie in between the very blue lighting lightning and our warm model here. Hmm. I don't know. Yeah, it might be one of those things where you'd have to go into the color sliders and start manipulating mm -hmm. some of those those tones. Mm -hmm. um, but because if I did like the the guy being warmer, uh, his skin tone being warmer, but I see the point that that uh, just Kyle's making. Um, yeah, it's mm. wow. Look at this. It's amazing yeah. how much you can go in and change this stuff. And and y y don't be afraid to to experiment you know you just got to know where to pull it back to reality sometimes um yeah yeah what happens if we just uh take the yeah what happens if this is a black and white is that silly hmm. maybe not Act actually it's pretty cool to me <laughs> It, it looks pretty cool because there's so much texture in this image and yeah. when you have those competing colors yeah that um, that's exactly i mean the colors have to go well together yeah. And sometimes that's in the way you shoot it. And sometimes it's in the way you edit it. I want to have a show where it just happens that every picture we suggest we go black and white. That'd just be <laughs> kind of fun. All right. I love it. It's, it's a cool shot, Vince. And, uh, you know, I just joked about that. But here we go. Ursula's got this neat sand pattern shot. Oh, yeah. Um, and, you know, my first thought is we're looking at this pattern over and over again. And, well, Ursula, you've already done it. You've turned it black and white. Let's see what the color version looked like real quick. It wasn't much color to begin with, just a little bit of stuff here and there that picked it up. So I think black and white is the way to go. Mm, yeah. You know, um, when you look at an individual image like this, it's, it's neat, but it's not something that you, I think you would think about putting the 40 by 60 on your wall. Um, right. Probably. But what I like about this and what I talk about on the on the workshops fairly often is think about making a triptych, you know, three images on a wall that tell the story of the place. So I know Ursula lives down in the south, I think not too far from like the Gulf Coast area. Mm -hmm. And you've got beautiful beaches down there and you've got this neat pattern. So three images like a, a gorgeous sunset and then sitting next to it, the neat pattern in the sand and then sitting next to that, maybe the detail of a shell or maybe a bigger landscape that shows, you know, the, those pines that are, you know, that go right up to the beach or something like that. Yeah. So I think that's neat. I, 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 if I can just add one thing, I, I do like, uh, I think it's important to shoot, uh, images like this in the, in the different places you guys go, because even though it may not be like the, the, the big shot, it, it could be, I mean, any, any of this could be, but it, it texture, having little texture pieces to throw into your portfolio or into the t telling of the story of where you went, I think it helps. I really do. I, and it's simple, it's repetitive but it kind of like reminds you of what it's like to walk on that sand and to see it when you're walking on it. So, yeah. 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 Nice. Uh, and let's see. I think, I mean, I think I've, I like it. Maybe I bump up texture a bit more here to just kind of really emphasize those, those lines um, and not much more. Y you could go in and clean up some of these little bits of black. You don't need to do all of them. But some of them just catch my eye, some of the bigger ones, mm -hmm. uh, other little bits and debris. And I actually just noticed as I brought the texture up that there's bird tracks through it. Mm. Uh, that's I hadn't noticed that until I did that. Let me reset texture and see. Are they really that hard to see or did I just miss them? Oh, they're there. I just missed them. Hmm. Okay. Nice, Ursula. Uh, we're going to move on uh, to Paul Anderson's shot. Paul went on a trip um, uh, to the uh, Kenai Peninsula, Katmai National Park area of Alaska, and he has come back with some fantastic bear catching salmon photos, the classic stuff. Hmm. Um, and I've been jealous of some of what he's been posting. It's just really good stuff. Uh, good job, Paul. And here we just, you you have focused in on and cropped in on too, I think, uh, just the kind of classic salmon coming up the waterfall. Hmm. 
And I think there's a lot to like here, um, but it's not quite as sharp as I would like. And I can't figure out why. The water here feels sharp. Your shutter speed is nice and fast, 1 16,000th of a second. But the salmon himself just doesn't seem quite as sharp as I want. Actually, it looks like his tail is quite sharp back here. Hmm. But that's really it. I don't, I don't know. I'm not sure that there's much I would do with this image other than maybe you could brush on some texture. Yeah, that, that might help too. Um, you, and even if you can brush in whatever level of sharpness that would, that could, that could serve the photo, it's, you, you can't fully sharpen something that's not fully sharp, but you can sometimes trick it, trick the eye a little bit into seeing it a little sharper. Yeah. Whatever you yeah. just did there. Yeah. That helps a little bit. Uh, you could also try Smart Sharpen in uh, Lightroom, or sorry, Photoshop as well. That might be able to sharpen it a little bit more. Yeah, definitely. Um, but it's it's still, it's a neat shot and a neat moment. And I imagine that just upstream is a big hungry bear. Gosh, <laughs> so cool. <laughs> All right, uh, Ursula, you've got another shot in here. Uh, I saw these shots. Uh, I'm friends with Ursula on Facebook, and this is really neat. This is called the Tunnel to Towers event. It's in Biloxi, Mississippi. It honors the firefighters and other first responders who lost their lives on 9-11. It's mm. a 5K run, walk, followed by climbing 110 flights of stairs in their gear. Uh, you know, which just, uh, first off, hats off to firefighters and rescue personnel all over the world. What they do is, is amazing and uh, just awesome. Uh, and, uh, just, I can't even begin to imagine, uh, running with all of this gear on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I like this a lot. I think I, I really like that. It's not a portrait where he's posing it's he's in action and, um, and you can see his eyes, which is incredibly important for something like this. Um, I would probably crop it down just a touch to get the, it looks like there's maybe a lady's arm there. Mm -hmm. I'd probably crop that out. Yeah, yeah, there was a little. Yeah, yeah. Um, good call. I would probably crop that out a little. It's okay to cut a little bit of his arm off to, well, that sounds bad to say, but you know what I mean. It's <laughs> it's okay to cut into that a little bit to lose what what little bit of hers that you're seeing um, because you're still telling the story of him. Um, yeah, it just, those little subtle things. And when you did that, you also ended up cropping out some stuff that was in the top of the frame, which I felt yeah. like might have been distracting. Um, yeah, this just a, looks like windows or something. Yeah. Uh, I'm finding more and more with these types of shots, uh, that I, I get in really tight and close cause that's really what you're trying to capture is the, the expression and the, the, the mood. And, um, you don't always need a lot of extra information around the subject to, to accomplish that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I agree, uh, fully with that and, and, uh, yeah. Fully. Uh, I think you did a great job with focus. This the front of the helmet and the eyes, even though they're behind this, really seem to be sharp and focused. And then he kind of falls out of it. Um, yes. I mean, just a little bit softer, but that's that's totally fine. Uh, I noticed you've done a vignette here. I really only notice it when his hand comes into view and when we shifted that crop a little bit. I might back that off. I might not do mm -hmm. it quite as strong. Um, just whoops, not plus, but maybe in there and, and maybe even brighten this corner just a tiny, tiny bit um, with, let's see, shadows and uh, texture still on too. Just a little bit. So it doesn't feel like, so it's so dark and dingy down in the corner, but otherwise I think this is great. Nice. Yeah. It's a really great shot, Ursula. Very, very cool. All right. And now we're going to move on. Uh, we've got Kevin Walk. He spent the uh, weekend, I think at the Indy 500, um, this, I don't think this is the Indy 500 based on the grass and stuff, but I don't know. I don't know these things. <laughs> so I'll just keep my mouth shut <laughs> and say, I bet this car is an electric. Kevin and I have a little thing. He shows me pictures of cars with big, fancy engines. And I say, I'd rather a Prius personally, Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> it's just our thing. Yeah. Um, this is probably not electric, but I bet it goes really fast. I would imagine so. This is a fantastic shot. It's it's pretty cool. Um, really nice panning shot. Look look at how we've got some panning. We've got that motion blur. You panned with the vehicle. It is sharp. Mm -hmm. um, but the background is starting to get a little blurry. You're at a 1 over 320. 
um, which I, I'm surprised that fast the shutter speed gets you a panning shot like that. But with a little bit of a longer focal length, 135 and the speed of the car, I'm, I'm guessing I'm, yeah, okay. Yeah, it's really great. And you did it properly. I mean, it, it, it seems like you knew what you were doing. But um, I, I one of the things I had to learn, uh, I, I went to an air show a couple of years ago, did a couple a couple of air shows. And, um, you know, you, you think, oh, I want to be at a really high shutter speed and freeze everything. No, you want to freeze the motion. You, you want to freeze the, the car and keep it in focus. But you want to see that the wheels are turning and you yeah. want to see that the, that the car is moving really quickly. And so if you had shot this at one two thousandth of a second or one four thousandth or something, it would it just wouldn't have that same urgency of movement to it and uh so i it's it's not easy to get these shots you have to pan with the vehicle and you have to take a bunch of them and and only a, a few are going to be in focus but very nice yeah uh i think that's a great point because if you froze everything it could feel like the car was just parked there and then that has no that's that's not dynamic yeah yeah you want to yeah, go ahead no go ahead go ahead uh, just because Kevin says he nailed some at one eight hundred or sorry one eightieth of a second too. Now Kevin, I would imagine that gave you a lot more background blur. I, I would like a tiny bit more. I'm being picky here, but I'd yeah, like a little I, more. I'm with, you. I'm with you on that. So I'm I'm going to go into Photoshop and fake it a little bit, uh, just because I think Photoshop can do a good example of this. So I'm going to go to Select Subject. This is where Photoshop decides what your subject is, and oftentimes it does a pretty good job. Let's see how it does here. All right outlined the car pretty nicely and its shadow uh, yeah that all works it's it missed part of its shadow over here but uh, for the purposes of this demonstration good enough i'm going to go back there i'm going to modify this a little bit i'm going to expand it just a bit four pixels so it's just moving away from the car a little bit more than the car now i'm going to modify it to feather it two pixels so it softens that edge it fades it out a little bit now i'm going to inverse it and I'm going to filter motion blur. Now, if I was really doing this carefully, I'd probably create another layer that gives me a little bit more room to work with. Um, but let's just real quick say uh, blur, motion blur. And this little dial here controls the direction. So we don't wanna go up and down. We wanna go in the same direction that you were already panning. And then the distance is of course, uh, how much blur you're going to do. Now you can see as we start to get up to high numbers, this, the background really gets soft, but then we start to screw up our subject a bit. It's starting to glow in some kind of weird, unnatural way. So just a little bit, maybe somewhere in there, very carefully, there's still some issues. If I take them away, the marching ants, you can see that there's a little bit of kind of ghosting and shadowing. That's bad. You don't want that. But um, I think it's just added just a little bit more uh, yeah, softness to the background. And I don't know, some people might say, oh, no, you touched Photoshop. This isn't a real image anymore. Ah, that's, you know, that's true. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> but if yeah. you like the way it looks, then uh, you like it. Yeah. yeah, well, that's just, I mean, I understand when people say stuff like that, but at the same time, if you do anything to modify it, then you've touched it. I mean, it's if, if it doesn't, if it's not exactly what you shot, then you've already modified it. So, mm -hmm. um, but I agree. I think more motion blur could help it. Um, and it's good that you shot multiple shots and got some, it got more that are in focus. So you have that variety to choose from. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty cool. All right. Uh, we are done with this segment. So back here for a second. And what do I do now? This button right here, I think, ah, Hello, everybody. All right, let's move on. We're going to make this show. You know, I was bragging about that I'm already packed, but I do have other stuff to do. So we do have to end the show. And I, David Carr, I didn't talk to you, but I'm sure you have like a family to get back to here at some point. So let's uh, uh, maybe let's get to a few news stories. Um, all right. First up, Tamron 17 to 28 issues. I teased this a while ago. So I got this lens the moment it was uh, released because of my experience with the Tamron 28 to 75. I'm very happy with that lens. I've been very happy with the 17 to 28 and just now taking it on the Southwest trip where we spent time in the Slot Canyons, looking at those image, I have no issues at all. This thing is sharp. It is a good all around lens, but from time to time, it just doesn't focus. 
Mm. Uh, I, you know, it, it didn't happen to me at all before I did my review because I mostly focused that review on stars. That's what I, when, when we walk, talk about lenses this wide, that's mostly where I'm personally using them. Uh, but as I used it more in the Southwest, there were just times where it would just go ee -er, ee -er. and mm. then it, if you weren't watching carefully, it would go to infinity and with a wide angle lens, infinity often is good enough for most of the shots. So it looked like it was in focus through the viewfinder, but I had noticed that the little uh, autofocus indicator didn't turn green. I thought, mm. hmm, that's funny. And then I noticed that it did it a couple more times. Over the course of the trip, um, it did it, and this lens was on my camera uh, often. It did it probably about once every two days. Mm. I think not more than that, but right around that. And Tim, uh, who was in chat earlier, he also has this lens. Uh, it happened to him at least once. And then I saw Dan Watson put up his review of this lens and he also was using it on the new A7R4 and he mentioned that it was happening to him. So uh, this happens with third party lenses. They're, they don't get all of the talky talky between the two so correct all the time. I think this is gonna be fixed with a firmware update I think it's very fixable, the firmware update, so I'm not worried about it. But if you're somebody who needs every single shot and never messed up any shots in the Southwest because these were all like nothing moved away, you know, but mm. but, you know, if you're somebody who's shooting models or in critical situations, I might hold off on buying this lens until you hear that this has been worked out because it will cause you to. Uh, you know, miss a shot from time to time or miss focus from time to time, especially if you're not watching carefully. So come on, Tamron, let's get that fixed. You had some issues with the 2875 that you completely fixed. I want to see this fixed so that I can fully recommend this lens because for the money, it is fantastic. Hmm. And I also did see Dan Watson. I didn't watch his review. I just saw him comment. Somebody asked him about this lens specifically on the A7R4. You know, with 61 megapixels, uh, it really does push lenses to the limit. He said, when you view one-to-one, -one, you do start to see some Maybe it's not quite as sharp as the 16 to 35 F2.8 from Sony. And we got we get a lot of these kind of complaints of like Sony lenses are so expensive. They are. I agree. Um, but they are also incredibly sharp. They knew these cameras with massive megapixels down the line were coming and they made them able to resolve those amounts. I see type people from time to time saying, oh, you know, we used to have these lenses. You could get a decent 17 to 30 lens for like $399. Yeah, but they're not going to look good at 61 megapixels. No. That that was great when we had 12 and 18 megapixel cameras. We've moved past that. And uh, you got to pay uh, those bigger prices for those lenses. Definitely. Yeah. yeah. Um, so in Kate saying, do I think it's just this copy? No. So I've heard from a couple of people now. Um, so I think it is a little bit more widespread. And again, once every two days, and I was taking a lot of pictures it, it's not a, you know, a huge issue, but it, if you own it already, it's something to watch out for. If you're thinking about buying it, maybe hold off until you've heard that it's been fixed. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, and then this laptop. So this is the, we're, we're into the segment of the issues. David, will you be my therapist? I have a lot of yeah, issues. Sure. Let's, uh, you have, what, what's, what's troubling you, Toby? You have the voice. Okay. Well, first let me say about the things that I like about this laptop. It is a 4k screen gorgeous screen. I mean, this screen is just beautiful. It doesn't really, I mean, this video is going out at 720p, but it's just a gorgeous screen. It's the colors are fantastic. It looks great in all kinds of light. Um, I think this laptop looks great from a distance. I think it's kind of angular design is fun. I think the white is cool. It is super lightweight for the size of it. When I hold this up and compare it against this, you know, this brick of a Mac, uh, it's a pretty <laughs> significant difference. And uh, what else do I like about it? Um, oh, it's got lovely ports, lovely, full size HDMI, two USB, USB-C, a headphone jack, another USB-C, and an SD card slot. Amazing. <laughs> oh, come on. Oh, that's all nice. But when you touch it, it feels cheap. Mm. And, you know, it feels more plasticky than I want it to. And uh, I can live with that. I think, you know, that's where you get some of that lightweight from. It doesn't feel like it's going to break anytime soon. It just kind of 
feels a little cheap. Hmm. This trackpad, it just is not s as smooth as I want. It it just, you know, why can't other people do trackpads as good as this? This this trackpad is ancient. This is what I bought this computer in spring of 2014, coming up on over five years, and it just it's lovely. Hmm. I love this trackpad. Yeah, it's really <laughs> nice. Caress it. <laughs> this show just became one of those ASMR. Just watch me touch my trackpad. <laughs> um, hey, that could be that could be interesting. Yeah, yeah. I'm with uh, you on the trackpad. The the Apple trackpads are really, really just perfect. Yeah. Uh, Kevin is asking if it's aluminum or plastic. I uh, the body it is plastic definitely. Um, the the trackpad I don't know, but my finger sticks on it some. And also, what was the other thing I wanted to say? Oh. This has nice specs. It's an i7, 3.1 gigahertz, 16 megabytes of RAM. It's got a Radon RX Vega M in it. Uh, that graphics card isn't top of the line, but it's all pretty good specs. Uh, sure. eighth, eighth gen i7 in here. But Lightroom does not feel snappy on here. It mm. does not. Those specs should be able to handle Lightroom. And Part of my issue here, this is going to make some of you groan, but part of my issues here is that it's running Windows. The UI of Lightroom in Windows is different. There's little bits that are weird. I can't remember who I was talking to, though. Somebody said mine doesn't look like that. So I don't know what is different. But, um, you know, the, the HSL color sliders that we were just working on, they're also teeny tiny in the Lightroom on here. They're, mm. they're not on my Mac. Um, and none of the other panels are like that. It's just... Yeah. So I, I could take this to Mongolia. They they lent it to me for a long enough period of time. It is a lot lighter than mine. And and it has the, a lot of stuff I like. But you know what? I think I'm just going to take my heavy old Mac because mostly because of the trackpad and the sluggish feeling. I mean, when you're actually using it, the, the, the weight of it's not going to be a, an issue. So it's just yeah. the carrying of it that will, you know, make the difference. But yeah. One last complaint. Oh, come on. What is this freaking proprietary stupid little thing? I c why can't we have USB-C power? Let's go. USB-C power. Seriously. Uh, and this this big old clunky thing, it just seems so old. <laughs> so where's the other end of it? You know, and then there's this, this, this brick down here. It's actually not that bad. That's, you know, but it's just... The, the Apple snob in me is biting his tongue really hard right now. I know. And I really, I, 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 could, I can use Windows. I, I don't really care. Once you're into Lightroom, for the most part, other than some of the weird things I see here, um, you know, and Chrome, it's basically the same. Sure, it wants to update itself a little bit more often, but I got Norton popping up over here every five minutes saying, oh, you should update me or you're going to die. You know, I, I just don't have that on the Mac. I'm sorry. And yeah, that, that computer back there is from 2014, but it feels snappier. Its trackpad feels better. I just weighs a lot more. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Pick your poison, you know. I know. I know. So sorry, Asus. I really appreciate you sending this along. I'm looking forward to seeing more stuff out of you in the future, but so I'm is, not a big fan of this Concept D laptop. Is it Asus or Acer? Because somebody was asking. They oh, said it's were... it's Acer. Did I? Yeah, I'm sorry, Acer. Yeah. Okay. They said in the show notes it said Asus. So just wanted to. Oh, yeah. I should fix that. Yep. You're right. Uh, let me fix that now. Acer. There. Oh, seems like I know what I'm talking about. Okay. Let's move on. I, okay. Those are all my issues. Um, <laughs> That's it. Uh, now we're going to talk about happy things. One of them is uh, Peak Design. Good company. I'm not a fan of all of their products. Their their recent uh, carbon fiber travel tripod, I think, has some uh, nice features to it. But for the price is a little, you know, value. Um, but they're going green. Where's this article? I want to talk about this for a second. Dun, dun, dun. Uh, this is in the Denver Post. Your food has labels. These entrepreneurs think your outdoor brand should too for the climate. So Peak Design CEO Peter Daring and Jonathan Cedar, he's the CEO and co-founder of BioLight. They make the kind of cool camping lanterns and headlamps and stuff like that. They are launching a new um, kind of, uh, it's similar to like an organic sticker on your fruit, except it's going to say that this company is carbon neutral. You know, awesome. I, 
I don't think it's any kind of big surprise. I'm a bit of a hippie. I care about the environment. We get to go to these gorgeous, beautiful places. I would like to see them stay gorgeous and beautiful for a very long time, for at least for my children and their children. Um, and so all of these fancy, shiny things we buy, they have a cost beyond the dollars that we pay. And when a company can start to think about their environmental impact and ways to offset that, for me, as a as a consumer, as con I am a conscious consumer, I don't want to feel like I got a million dollars. Oh, I didn't tell my dog story. I'll have to tell that in a minute. I don't want to be like, I got a million dollars spent on wherever. I want. I, I want to spend it on companies that are being thoughtful about these things. So I just thought that was really nice of Peak Design to make move forward. Sure, it's a little bit of marketing on their standpoint, but I honestly feel like it is a genuine a genuine feeling from them that they need to do something. Definitely. That's great. That's good so, to know. I wanted all to about it. Wanted to give them a shout out for that. Okay, back to shiny mirrorless things. Canon has just unveiled an entry level EOS M200. So that's their EOS uh, M line. Uh, that's their APS-C mirrorless line. It has got eye detection and 4K video. Nice. Yeah, uh, it comes in at, uh, let me open the article because I can't remember the price. I think it's reasonable, like 650. I'll share the screen with you all here so you can kind of see. Um, Let's go right there. Uh, sorry. Give me a second to remove that from the stream. No, I really know what I'm doing. I do. There. Good. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so here it is. Here's a nice little picture. Pretty nice little pop-up flash. Um, Eye detection autofocus is nice. I really feel like that's a pretty big game changer. Yes. Uh, it's got Digic 8 processor. Um, it has the 4K at 24p, which is not in the Canon EOS R mirrorless. You can't mm. shoot at 24p. Uh, mm. It is the cropped, so it's in a little bit more. You got 1080 at 60, vertical videos, export. It's a 24 megapixel sensor. Uh, so it's not the same sensor that they recently put in their 90D flip up touchscreen for selfies. And uh, here's a few more pictures of it. Uh, and I'm sure they'll tell us the price here at the bottom of this. 550 in a kit with that 15 to 45 lens. Hey, that's not bad. Not bad at all. Um, but there, I feel like Canon is still in this little bit of an issue of mount confusion. So you go into the EOS M system and you're buying the EFM lenses or e EM lenses. Um, they doesn't fit the EOS R or the RF lenses, which are the full frame mirrorless so you're kind of in this little bit of a, a dead end. You can throw on adapters and then you have the whole EFS and EF range of lenses available to you. But this mirrorless crop body doesn't kind of nicely transition you to full frame. So, um, I don't know. Uh, but if you're just looking for a nice little camera, this looks like a pretty good camera at a pretty good price. And that Canon is um, very good. Oh, it looks cool. Yep. Sigma discontinues Pentax K mount to focus on mirrorless. Poor Pentax. Uh, Adobe has released updates for the brand new cameras, including the A7R4. It had preliminary support for them, but now it's got official support along with a Fuji camera as well and a couple other things. I already mentioned that rumor about the Sony A7S uh, shooting 4K at 120 and probably having a built in cooling fan. And. David, have you looked into this at all? Nikon is really rumored to release a Z8 with a 60 megapixel resolution and 16-bit RAW. Well, I haven't really looked into it much because I feel like every time there's a rumor, there's not a whole lot of information. Um, mm -hmm. It's a lot of speculation. Um, and usually it's followed by a bunch of gripey, gripey um whiny people uh in the comment sections <laughs> so i just avoid a lot of that but um but i do think i mean i will not be surprised if they release something to try to rival the uh, a7r4 i mean if nikon and canon don't step up to the plate fast i mean and it may already be too late but i mean sony is obviously just cranking stuff out left and right and uh and good stuff so mm -hmm. um i love my nikon z6 i talk about it all the time um but you know, I can't see 
that being the, the thing that I'm going to want to use for the next two years. I'm, it, it would be great to see some real advancements coming out soon. So this would make sense. I mean, yeah. uh, I'd be interested. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's exciting. And yeah, again, a uh, 16 bit raw, I think Nikon did some really nice things in the Z six and Z seven line. Um, I think they were overpriced at the launch. But, I agree. Uh, the prices Absolutely. come down a little bit and yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's exciting. Uh, and also this article right over here linked, uh, I think is really exciting as well. It looks like they are making APS-C Z-mount cameras. And this seems smart because now, unlike Canon, you do have, you can buy into, you know, this example here, they got a Z3. Um, so you, you buy in, you're shooting that for a while, and then you get the bug to move up to full frame. Then, hey, it all kind of just works and transitions you so nicely. Sony right now really stands on top. It's so funny to me for, for years they weren't, but now all of a sudden they are the ones with the most or the least confusing mount system. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. works across a huge line. Uh, and so I think anything Nikon can do to kind of help there might work, uh, might be good. Yeah, I agree. I think yeah. Kate, uh, Kate just got a, a Z6, didn't you, Kate? Per um, my, I, no, I think, uh, I think Can Kate is a Canon shooter. She's asking when are they going to release a pro mirrorless talking about Canon? Oh, okay. I'm thinking, oh, I'm sorry. I was that's confused. Okay. Yes, that's okay. Um, but, uh, that, you know, it keeps getting pushed back. I feel like mm -hmm. Canon is kind of teasing and saying, oh no, don't leave for that. Don't leave for that 61 megapixel, beautiful Sony. No, no, no. We got something coming. It'll be 80 or yeah, yeah. It'll be a hundred. And I'm sure they'll come out with something eventually, but win is get on it you're canon they're like huge yeah. yeah i don't think it'll be before summer of next year and that feels pretty far away it's only september right now i've always got to think though like these are huge companies with like very smart people that run them you would think so any complaints that we have as consumers and even as professionals who use their equipment like any complaints we have they had to have considered this stuff I mean, when, when Apple comes out with a new device and people gripe about something about the inputs or whatever, it's not like they didn't know or think about it. But I do still have to wonder, like, what what leads to, like, lack of action or doing something that just the consumers are like, what? Like, mm -hmm. you're going to do, like, proprietary input on the, you know, power input on the computer? Like, why? Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I kind of let, let me try this analogy out. I think this is, you know, sometimes does your family have trouble uh, agreeing on what they want for dinner? often yes yeah yeah so now imagine if you had a really large family with really different like you know ideas of what a good meal was about that mm -hmm. i think is canon's issue they are huge they've got this marketing team they've got this engineers they've got the ceo head people um and i think that there is a lot of internal struggle in that company mm -hmm. to really try to figure out if they if if they can let go of the DSLRs mm -hmm. um, and really move on full frame into mirrorless. I think they're trying to straddle this world. There yeah. are some, I'm sure, in the company that are like, yeah, we got to get there. Let's go. Sony's kicking our butt, making us look bad. Mm -hmm. uh, not always. I mean, there are things that Canon does that I think are much better than Sony. But in general, kind of value for the camera right now for a lot of people, I think it's hard to overlook the Sony or the Z6 as being kind of better all around Nikon Z6 as all around cameras. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, that's a good yeah. way to look at it though. Yeah. It's just, yeah. I think, I think it is a lot of red tape and then it, and it's kind of like a, a government that started, you know, <laughs> Congress trying to get anything done. Uh, even if there are good ideas, it, 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 it's, it, it's not as easy as just, Oh yeah, that's a good idea. We'll implement that, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Brian's got a, a great point. Big companies get wrapped around their axles. They can't get out of their way or of their own egos often. Mm -hmm. I really true. think that's a very canon issue uh, right now. Uh, Gareth says, I think time is a critical factor of being able to actually respond and adapt to criticism. That I think that's true too. You know, we're talking about this Canon EOS, uh, a pro level mirrorless camera. I bet a lot of its specs are already baked in. Uh, and, and, you know, because when you think about the manufacturing that has to happen and all of that stuff that leads up to actually releasing, it is a big time period. Mm -hmm. And so when they start to plan a camera, maybe it is the best thing out there, but then Sony or Nikon comes along and says, Oh, look at this thing. <laughs> and so, yeah. Competition. So, competition. Let's go. Uh, let's go. Let's go to something nice and light. You maybe saw it teased on the screen for a moment here. Look at this. This is the cutest thing ever. Incredible. 
Dutch photographer Dick van Juij was visiting Vienna, Austria, when he captured adorable series of photos of a squirrel taking a moment out of its busy day to smell the flowers. I mean, uh, you know, we, we anthropomorphize animals so often, but dang, if it doesn't look like that little squirrel is nuzzling that flower like it's his best friend. It's the cutest thing I've seen in the last, like, hour. It's pretty incredible. <laughs> in the last hour. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in the last several days. Last this, my, this... my um my brother did send me a really cute picture of my niece the other day. She's adorable. But oh, this okay. is this is right there with it. Yeah, that's pretty darn cute, man. That's like Disney level. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Someone I think Disney probably in a couple of years will make a whole movie based off this picture. Oh yeah. It really yeah, yeah. it's it's like one of those Pixar short films or something, this little squirrel just smelling flowers. <laughs> But it's I'd, real. I'd watch it. I'd watch it. I would it. too. I would too. All scary. right. Um, uh, real quick, uh, Lincoln Park photographer captures 45 bolts of lightning in a single image. Uh, I got the show notes, I got a link to his Instagram. He's a pretty good photographer. Let's share that real quick. Um, oh my gosh. yeah, yeah. So it is a composite. Uh, he set his camera up. This is the view from his house. So pretty awesome, Ian. Um, Sony a7R2, he set it to take a picture every 3.2 seconds. Doesn't say what the, his exposure was. Um, I actually feel like maybe the exposure was three seconds and it probably was taking it every second. And he did that for an hour and 20 minutes and then he just overlaid them all together. Gosh. Um, and that's just wild. That's incredible. Very wild. But he's got, uh, he has got some nice collection of Chicago area images on his um, uh, Instagram feed, which, you know, if Steve was here, he used to live in Chicago and he could tell you a little bit more about some of these places, but he doesn't care about us anymore. So uh, <laughs> just me and me, me and David Carr. So, you know. We're just schlepping it here, man. <laughs> I told him I was going to give him a lot, a lot of crap because his reason is just like, it's decent enough, I guess, but <laughs> it's fine. Uh, I think we're going to start to wrap this show up. Uh, let's see real quick. Um, what else did I want to say? Oh, this is what I wanted to tell. Just to keep it real. Uh, I know my life seems pretty amazing. I'm headed to Mongolia tomorrow. I get to take it the brand new Sony a7R4 with me. I, that's all pretty good. This morning, I was walking down to my small studio basement place here. And uh, first off, uh, I noticed that one of the dogs, actually, I know which one, Lana, because she was outside our bedroom all night, peed on the top of the stairs. And I'm like, ah, oh, I got to clean up the pee. Continue walking down the stairs, walk into my office where I step in my bare feet in dog poo. Oh, man. So just because my life seems wonderful, I do still have to clean up dog poo off my feet sometimes. Just wanted to share that. That's a little balance. So, you know. No, that's good perspective. I, I mean, know. I have a staff that does that for me, but, <laughs> but um, yeah, no, no, it's just me in the tub with a brush this morning. Yeah. Cursing that dog. Cursing oh that yeah. Dog. But that, I, yeah. Yeah. But I was thinking, cause, it, cause you know, it's, it's kind of, you know, uh, figurative of the life. I know what I show on Instagram, what we all show on Instagram, what we share with people is very carefully curated. Very much um, so. And looks like it's all lots of fun and adventure. And I have to say, for the most part, it is. I am incredibly lucky. But um, every once in a while, I step in dog do. We all so, do. We all do. Yeah. It just sounds better when you say it through that microphone, David Carr, with your, dog with your lovely, <laughs> lovely voice. <laughs> So I appreciate it, man. I, I have to whatever it takes to to embellish my my um, my person, my what I'm projecting. I need a good microphone. I even upgraded my camera, so it looks good. It good. looks good. Thank Let's you. hit two Q and A's, um, and then we're gonna wrap up. Uh, Sub Vids wants to know from my wealth of experience, what is currently the best full frame hybrid camera? Uh, I got two options for you. The Sony a7 III, I think is fantastic, or the Nikon Z6. I think both of those are excellent video and photo machines. Loving it. And the EOS R is fine too. It's right there too. Any of those three, I think if you come with a large selection of lenses from already, you know, from Nikon or from Canon, then you just throw that adapter on and you're good. If you're starting from scratch, it's really hard to overlook the Sony. 
um, which just does. <laughs> Sorry, really good my job. dog. Speaking of dogs, now I've got mine barking in the back. But she's so cute. Sorry, you guys. She's totally fine. She's gonna gonna protect you. I'm gonna press the mute button. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, Andrew wants to know the knife that I had sticking threateningly in the box at the beginning. What brand? Uh, this is called Shrade. And uh, I found this on a photo shoot in Vermont, I don't know, nine years ago. It was totally moss covered, stuck in a log as I was walking down this little forested trail. And I picked it up and took it home with me because I didn't have one. And it is now my package knife. And I'm very happy with it because I always, I'm almost always put it back in the same place, which is kind of rare for me with stuff. So <laughs> I always know where to find it so that I can open my package. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, oh, Roy, you work for Shrade. So is it, is it a pretty common brand, I guess, then? That's right, Roy. You said you did some uh, photo work with them ages ago. Cool. All right. On that note, I think we're going to wrap this this show up. David Carr, thanks so much for hanging out with us today. Yeah, and, uh, absolutely. Yeah. I always love it. And uh, I, I got to be honest, sometimes I feel like I don't want to say too much because I don't want to rabbit trail. And I know we're trying mm. to keep it on the time you know, keep the time going, but I, uh, I really appreciate it. And I appreciate all of you letting me chime in and, and, uh, I respect what everyone's doing here. Like the fact that everybody's coming at this from just different angles, wanting to learn, wanting to get better, wanting to encourage one another. That's one of the best things I see is the encouragement we all give one another. We really need that sense of community. If we want to grow in this, in this field, whether you're doing it professionally or as just a hobby, just whatever, we all want to grow. We want to get better and we should, um, because there's so much we can still learn and, um, it, this helps me tremendously just to be able to talk about it. So thanks. For nice. having me. Yeah, it's awesome. So well said, uh, that's why I love having you, you, you share those thoughts and it's just so true. I think it's so easy to like, look at that person's Instagram or that person's Instagram and be like, Oh, there's so I don't want to talk to them. They're better or this or that. And man, it's all yeah. better when we're talking to each other and making stuff, uh, absolutely making stuff together. Absolutely. Cool. Yeah. Chat room, thank you so much for hanging out with us. If you're a pen member, thank you. Seriously, uh, I hope you're finding it valuable. And uh, we got some exciting stuff coming up towards the end of the year for our pen members. So stay tuned for that. If you're not, photorec.tv slash pen. And remember, if you're going to build a website, Squarespace dot com slash photorec tv will start you off right by saving 10 percent. reach out to me if you got any questions you want to look at what i built my entire photorec tv website now runs on squarespace so i'm very very happy with it i just got a bit of cleanup work to do because the transfer was a little rough uh, from my large site to squarespace but it is saving me a lot of money and a lot of time it's much easier to work with than the old system that i was running it on so Excellent. And uh, I'm not sure uh, when the show happens again. It's going to be a little while because Mongolia, then I'm back for a few days and the fall colors. There might be a Wednesday between those two. And I would love to do the show because even if I haven't packed all of my stuff, I love doing the show. It's fun. All right. Excellent. All right. I know David again. Thanks so much. Yeah, bye bye, everybody. We'll Have a great trip, to Toby. We'll see you again. Thanks, man. All right. And, oh, I second button I have to hit. Oh, press that thumbs up if you haven't already, folks.